we are, Capitol Building in Havana. We may be all smiles here, but this video is actually about things I hated on a recent trip to Havana, Cuba. I just got back from a trip to Havana, Cuba. I spent five days there. I took my wife with me and we had a fantastic time. In fact, I just uploaded a video on eight things we loved about our trip to Havana, Cuba. However, there are two sides to the story and there are some things that tourists, particularly American tourists, should be aware of before they visit Cuba. And so this video is a little bit more critical. So the first disappointment I had in Havana were the accommodations. I booked way ahead of time and I did it on Hotels.com, which I use all of the time. In fact, I stay in over a hundred hotel rooms a year, so I have a pretty good idea of what I'm getting into. Now we stayed in three different rooms during our time in Cuba and one of them was rated 9.4 on Hotels.com, which is an exceptional rating. Usually a 9.4 is among the best, highest rated places you're gonna find anywhere in the city. And that was the case here in Havana. Now keep in mind, there's no Hilton's or Marriott's or even European hotels such as Novotel. And so you're kind of left to choose between these boutique hotels. But even then, I was confident I was getting a good place. And I really wasn't. This was a disappointment. This room may look nice on this little video, but the bed wasn't that comfortable. There was kind of a musky smell. And there was even a problem with the toilet. They ended up having to move us. Now, none of the places we stayed were terrible, but none were really nice either. I just don't think there's too many luxurious places to stay in Havana. I did find walking around, there is one Kempinski Hotel, which is a high-end German brand. That's probably several hundred dollars a night. And you may want to stay with a host as well, but one thing is the rating online didn't match the quality in the hotel itself. Next thing we need to talk about is the money situation. Now, if you're an American, listen up. You need to bring cash into Cuba. There's no exception. Your credit card, your ATMs will not work anywhere. At restaurants, at banks, at ATMs, you can get zero money from your cards in Cuba. You must bring cash. And when you bring your cash in, just be aware that they're gonna take a 10% cut right off the bat. $1,000 becomes $900 the second you exchange it at the airport. So in Cuba, there are restaurants and souvenir shops, plenty of places to spend your money, but you're gonna be using cash for everything. And the cash you're going to be using is called the CUC. Now it's generally a one-to-one -one exchange rate for the American dollar, minus that 10% cut they take. They do also have a local currency, but you're not really gonna deal with that as a tourist. Just remember to bring plenty of cash because if you don't, if you need additional money, you're gonna have to visit this place and have a family member back home wire you money. This is the American Embassy and the only way to get funds if you're an American is to have money from a family member wired to the Embassy. And so bring plenty of money. And if you have extra cash, you may wanna just spend it all because exchanging it back to American dollars at the airport is a huge hassle. Depending on your time of day, the line could be as much as 90 minutes long. That's about how long we spent in this line at the airport trying to exchange our money back into American dollars. And then this, this not so kind gentleman in the blue backpack you see, he actually had about five family members cut right in front of us at the last minute. And so we had to go catch our flight. We were unable to exchange the rest of our money back. Just make sure to plan ahead of time to exchange your money. It's a long line at the airport. Let's talk about internet for a minute because internet in Cuba is a frustration. It's likely at your hotel, but it's gonna be limited to the lobby. It's probably not in your room. And you can find internet in various places around the city. Usually there's Wi-Fi spots, but even then you have to buy a card like you see here and log in with a passcode each and every time. And when you log in, the internet speed is just kind of medium speed. It's probably fast enough to stream or watch a video occasionally, 
but don't bank on that. It is fast enough certainly to check your email and your social media, but it's certainly not lightning quick like you're gonna find in the States. It's probably the equivalent to a 2G or 3G speed. Now, some people will say it's so great to be in Cuba where you're disconnected from the internet and you're not on your smartphone all the time. And I agree with that to an extent, but there's a limit. I've got teenage kids. My wife and I are both involved in our businesses. We just can't be disconnected for days at a time. It's not realistic. Not only that, but we live in a golden age of travel where there's smartphone and there's data plans and you have access to things like Google Maps and Uber and TripAdvisor. These are convenient and in some ways crucial things to have on a trip. It's really nice to be traveling around in a taxi or going on a convertible ride and have access to those features where we can look stuff up and learn as we're going along. That's not available to you in Cuba, not even the slightest bit. There is no data. It's literally like you're going back in time 20 years before all this stuff existed. The other thing I didn't love about Cuba was the lack of amenities. The type of things that you would find in a convenience store. Quite frankly, I didn't see any convenience stores in all of Cuba. That's not to say they don't have stuff. You can find what you need there, but it's just not as accessible and not as easy to get. In fact, uh, one morning I asked a lady, hey, where can I find a Coca-Cola and also some toenail clippers? And she said to me, oh, you're asking too much. And then she did find a, a place and pointed on a map to where I could go find something, but it certainly wasn't as easy or accessible to get as it would be in almost any other place in the world. We've got to talk a little bit about the urban blight in Havana. It's a sad thing, but even along the main areas in town, like on this street, the Prado, where a lot of the artwork is, it's a beautiful boulevard. It just needs some paint. It needs to be renovated. It needs to be cleaned up. The blight in this town is very unfortunate. And if you remember my other video, if you watch my other video, one of the things I loved about Havana is the architecture, the Baroque style, and how it juxtaposes with the, with the classic cars. It's really a beautiful town, but it's like, come on, just clean it up a little bit. I mean, these dumpsters, just ranked and stunk so bad. They're right next to one of the main museums in the central part of old Havana. It's like, come on Havana, you can do this. Clean it up a little bit, build up some of these places. This city has a lot going for it, but the blight here is one thing I really didn't love about Havana. Now, to be fair, Havana is not the only place in the world that is a bit run down and has some urban blight, even in the heart of the city. But that leads me to my next point, is usually there's a trade-off. If you go to a place that might be a little run down or is in the developing world, perhaps a place like Vietnam or Thailand or Philippines or even Mexico or other places in Latin America, usually you can live like a king. Your dollar goes a long way. But in Havana, it's very expensive, surprisingly expensive. Taxi rides are $20, $30. You want a massage? 40 bucks if you include the tip. Dinner can run you over $50 for a couple. Those are prices you're gonna find in the States or even in Europe. More than one occasion, my wife even said, you know, for the money we're spending here in Cuba, we could have really gone on a luxurious cruise. And she's right. So what to make of Cuba, a place with beautiful beaches and amazing architecture, classic cars that are out of this world. Also a place that struggles with things like basic internet and doesn't even have luxurious accommodations anywhere on the island. Some will say, well, it's the communism. Communism is the problem with Cuba. And I think they've got a point. The private sector here is in its infancy. But at the same time, I've been to other communist countries, even recently, places like Cambodia and Vietnam, even Russia. They all seem to be doing a lot better than Cuba. 
Now, the Cuban people, they will tell you that what troubles Cuba is the American embargo. That's what's holding them back. And they've clearly got a point. The American embargo has definitely hurt Cuba economically. Cubans almost take it as a matter of pride. They approach you and say, hey, there's no capitalism here. There's no mafia. As if the mafia were America's big problem. You got to remember in this whole thing that Cuba is a Latin American country along the lines of Guatemala or Nicaragua or even Mexico. And it struggles with the same thing that developing Latin American countries struggle with. And so in reality, I think it's probably a mix of all three of what troubles Cuba and why it maybe isn't a better place to visit. And so would I come back here? Well, I thought it was a good place to come once but I don't know that I'll be returning anytime soon. I, I don't think that the amenities were that great, quite frankly. And my dollar didn't go far enough. I don't think it was a great bang for the buck place to visit, especially with my wife when I was looking for a relaxing and luxurious vacation. So there you have it. The highs and the lows of Cuba. A good place, sure. A place I was happy to visit. But I don't know that I'll be coming back anytime soon.